we're live. Uh, so yeah, this is Arto Bendiken coming from uh, uh, an undisclosed location in the beautiful countryside of uh, Western Ukraine. Uh, as I like to say, I'm by the foothills of the Carpathians. And um, over here we have a situation that's uh, very, very interesting from the point of view of um, uh, anarchism or indeed uh, crypto anarchism. Um, on, on the one hand, we have an utterly inept state. Uh, the Ukrainian government is famously corrupt, uh, famously incompetent, um, and their response to this whole uh, <clears throat> emerging pandemic has been an utter mess. Uh, just to underline that, um, in the last uh, three weeks, there have been three health ministers in Ukraine. Um, and I, I wouldn't uh, place, place any money on the current one getting anything useful done. So the, the state response is not going to save anybody over here. Uh, on the on the other hand, uh, we have a, a grassroots response from the business community and from um, some individuals. Uh, so over over here, um, uh, there's a ventilator shortage, the same as everywhere. Uh, there's only after an exhaustive survey, um, privately conducted, of course, um, there's uh, six thousand ventilators in in Ukraine, and that will not be enough uh, for the uh, situation that is soon upon us. Um, so on the one hand, the business community has taken the initiative. They've, um, for example, the business community in Odessa is uh, sourcing ventilators wherever they can. Um, they are trying to order from China. Those will be delivered at the earliest July, August, something like that. So that will be too late. Um, the, there's, there's efforts to restart a production line from Soviet times uh, where they used to make um, ventilators uh, for the soldiers coming back from Afghanistan. Um, and, and of course, there's uh, any number of people, myself included, who are very interested uh, to contribute uh, to their local hospitals by um, attempting to manufacture some of these open source ventilator designs we've seen. So that, that's, a, that's a very, very nice response on a, on a private level, nothing to do with the state. Um, it gets, uh, it gets even, even more interesting. Hold on, if I can, I can see my notes while at the same time. All right, so turning on the mic fully. Uh, so it gets even more interesting. Over over here in the uh, Lviv region, the business association known as uh, Lviv IT Cluster um, has done what the government ought to have done, but has failed to done, do. Um, they they are sourcing tens of thousands of uh, test kits from China. Uh, what has happened with the uh, state purchased ones, uh, nobody really knows. The, the, the contents of the first uh, flight um, that was supposed to bring hundreds of thousands of tests to Ukraine, well, uh, it's not clear what happened to the contents of that flight. There's a second one that supposedly landed uh, three, four days ago, and maybe uh, finally test kits will be distributed to uh, local hospitals. Until now, uh, Ukraine has performed about 2,600 tests for a population of about 40 million. So that means that the per capita testing ratio is about the worst in the world. Um, <clears throat> the best estimate is that there are currently tens of thousands of infected people in Ukraine, but the confirmed uh, case count is still less than a thousand. So we, we hear reports that uh, uh, local hospitals, uh, many, many hospitals have hundreds of pneumonia cases, um, pneumonia for unknown origin. From the nurses and doctors I know in uh, Lviv personally, uh, they've told me of pneumonia deaths long before we had any um, confirmed case in here. So about one or two weeks before any any confirmed cases in Ukraine. Um, so the situation is uh, is pretty interesting that uh, we have a utterly inept uh, government uh, that's not, um, for one thing, uh, managing to organize an effective response, um, and uh, also, by the way, not paying enough to the healthcare workers. So in, in some hospitals, as many as 50% of the staff have quit. Um, now, the, the, on the other hand, then we have the business community, for example, in Odessa, in the beautiful seaside Odessa. Uh, they've, um, they've raised about uh, $1 million to privately pay uh, salaries to about 3,000 uh, ER um, uh, personnel, um, doctors and nurses uh, during this month of April. Uh, so about one one million dollars, almost one million dollars for April, and uh, presumably they intend to do that uh, every month going forward. So this is on top of the uh, minuscule government salaries that the the nurses and doctors are getting. 
and the unfortunately that hasn't uh, stemmed the outflow the people quitting uh, perhaps understandably uh, as, as as the doctors and nurses have become aware in the last few weeks what they are facing uh, the uh, the idea of, of working for almost no salary and having no protective protective equipment more importantly uh, so the, the state has failed to provide the protective equipment to keep the healthcare workers uh, from getting infected um, that hasn't been a very appealing uh, option and i know i know personally uh, doctors who have uh, quit and headed to the countryside to sit this out and i can't i can't blame them so so we have this uh, this very very interesting situation that i'm sure is is not um, anything like any any eu country that when you have a government that's so um, corrupt and incompetent that they can't get the job done um, in any case people want to live what is there to do but to to self organize so so we have we have seen this really here in ukraine uh, the uh, the testing kits for lviv for example the idea with those is that uh, they will set up um, uh, mobile testing stations around the city and anybody can come and get tested um, so nothing to do with government it's totally a private uh, initiative so perhaps uh, something similar to what happened in 2014 uh, when when the russian invasion came there was uh, there was nothing uh, there was no response from the government the government had a uh, practically no standing army so it was volunteers who held off the invasion until the state got its ass in gear which took uh, more than six months so without without those uh, volunteers holding the line uh, ukraine would have been overrun in case uh, putin decided to overrun it that, that part is not so clear uh, so uh, that's the unique situation over here and that raises a, a lot of uh, uh, questions for, for people of our um, orientation let's say that for, for one thing um, we have seen these lockdown measures, the state-imposed lockdown measures in uh, various parts of the world here as well. Uh, here we have something akin to martial law without calling it martial law. So the state, for example, reserves itself the right to, to appropriate um, houses and cars and other property um, for you know the lightest of justifications. And with a corrupt police that may play out, um, we, we'll see how that works out. Um, so the, the the situation is with the lockdown that um and i think this would be the central central question for our conversation today um on the one hand as as uh, anarchists we cannot um we cannot consider that the the states claim that everybody must uh, stay inside uh, for for any reason um, as in, you can't take a walk, you can't uh, uh, you can't walk your dog, you you can't uh, take a walk around the local lake, something like this. Um, we can't consider it to be legitimate. As in, uh, it's clear to any intelligent person we need to be social distancing. But in case you do not meet other people, um, there's not really any justification for curtailing our our movement. Um, on the other hand, we see that. Uh, as, as Smuggler put it in the in the panel description, people are fucking stupid. As in the vast majority, the super majority of people seem to be stupid enough to not uh, understand the situation. Um, and for example, the beaches in Odessa were full last weekend, um, despite uh, people people were social distancing in hot dog queues. Uh, so this this poses a little bit of a dilemma to us and and everybody that. If people voluntarily don't do the right thing, um, what does that mean? It, perhaps it means that, from my point of view as a <laughs> Darwinist, uh, perhaps uh, an epidemic needs to burn through the populace so that they'll learn and next time they might do better. So with that, uh, let me hand it back over to you, Michael. Cool. I mean, it's, it's, it's really um, unbelievable. The, I, I think the thing that's most fascinating to me is watching how all the different countries respond um, to this in Europe and, and across the world. And I, I think it, it just exposes the reality of the things that we've been, that we've been living under. Um, it's really making it clear to people, you know, the, the obvious brutality of the state's monopoly on power. Um, 
in Berlin, uh, Smuggler and, and Frank Braun have been dealing with that with the Taz. Why don't you guys come on in and, and, and bring your perspective into this? Yeah, so we, we've been working on a local um, so-called Taz, Temporary Autonomous Zone, uh, where we basically set up containers to um, create an alternative space and um, build an alternative community which is also where we're able to, to move to a different location if that becomes necessary. Um, unfortunately, with this whole coronavirus situation, this right now has been put on hold. Um, and like we're doing here, we, we kind of had to move to the, to the virtual space. Like Arthur was already mentioning, uh, what's for me really the, the hardest part to deal with is how we're going to respond to it uh, in a voluntary way and I, I see that as having totally failed uh, in the sense that a lot of um, libertarians they didn't really do the things that they should do which is you know try to prevent the virus from spreading and um, which led to this situation that a lot of people have been calling for a strong state response, um, which is really, really hard to, to argue against when, when the state is, at least in, in some cases, um, asking for things that are the right, the right response. Yeah, I, I think I missed a, a little bit, but um, yeah, my, my observation so far has also been that we're really good, or really bad as a um, as societies with the, uh, to deal with this. And if we're um, envisioning uh, anarchistic societies, um, one thing that really scares me is, a, is an anarchist society of idiots. And I honestly have to say that I'm um, disappointed with most people and how they respond. And on the other hand, I'm very happy about a few exceptions that are amazing. You know, I mean, uh, there are a few people that are behaving well, that help others, that become active, you know, like uh, Artem mentioned from uh, Ukraine. But in, in a way, it's, it's one of those exceptions. And it's, for me, this has really driven home a point that if we are unable to build communities that are close to each other and that can organize their responses, um, then our impact is exactly zero. But what's really amazing to me is how the Austrians have responded to it. I mean, really, we have like 95% of the people uh, staying at home and, and in solidarity. So I guess there's always these national and local cultures that that um you know play a role in the people that we see around us and how it is that they're responding to things yeah that's important those are those are cultural factors and and they don't uh, directly have anything to do with the state even even more so the the state might reflect those cultural factors rather than the other way around i mean arto you've lived in a new number of european countries i remember you spent you spent some time in berlin uh and and then also a, a period in finland I recall back in the Bitcoin Foundation days, you were you were based in Finland. Um, how do you how do you see this so overall? You know, in a pan-European sense, do you think that Europe is gonna is gonna break down? Do you think that we're gonna lose Schengen? Um, do you think Europe's gonna gonna unify as a as a you know observer? Perhaps, arguably, the European Union is already um, de facto irrelevant. We have borders back, uh, people still using the euro, that's that's nice, and people still filing their VAT reports, but is anybody going to honor any directives coming from Brussels? And on the other hand, uh, the European Union now has a dictatorship as well, uh, Hungary. So, so yes, I would say that um, um, I personally hope this does, uh, does break apart the EU. I know not everybody sees it that way, but uh, in, in any case, uh, I'm for for more decentralized power instead of centralized, as I'm as I'm sure Frank and Smuggler would uh, agree. Um, so perhaps um, perhaps the the Brits um, will will be uh, like Frank, as in they will be cool for having done it before it was cool. 
Uh, I'm talking, of course, about Frank and the face masks. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, us nerds sitting in basements, you know, alone on laptops are the trendsetter for the world. So the audience uh, here listening to the live stream might not know that uh, that Arto and Frank and, and Smuggler have an amazing podcast. Um, and if you guys could post uh, the links to, to the Taz of um, podcasts into the Discord chat, that would be really awesome. Um, there's been two episodes um, that were that came out recently, Pandemic 1 and Pandemic 2. Pandemic 1 focused a lot on, on preparations uh, that you went through, um, Arto. You've been expecting this for a long time, along with you and me and Vinay. We've all been preparing for this, and, and people have called us preppers, but learning how to grow your own food and being prepared for the breakdown of society is something that... All of us have been doing for quite some time and um, and then in pandemic two i think you guys expanded out into a much more philosophical area and things if you guys want to pick up on that um give us give us some highlights about what people could expect when they listen to that four-hour podcast that that came out this last week yeah we mostly dealt with the um secondary effects um so the, the primary effect we have is there is uh, the virus itself, but then we have secondary and tertiary effects, which is basically how does the state respond to the virus? And we see there a lot of um, dangerous areas, how this could affect uh, our lives for a very long time. And uh, one of the most uh, concerning ones is uh, so-called contact tracing. And Smuggler has done a lot of work about this, and I think he wanted to to give you some some short intro and, and highlight the uh, the dangers there. And for anybody who wants more, um, as Michael noted, there's a four and a half hour uh, podcast, and and with the uh, earlier one we're talking about about seven seven hours plus. Uh, so for, only for people with long attention spans. Uh, Smuggler, you up? Contact tracing is uh, one of the areas I've been looking into, as well as immunity certificates. So um, let's see what that actually is. So the state's response to the uh, growing pandemic um, has not just been uh, lockdowns, but also trying to figure out how to deal with the thing um, in the long term. Uh, because the state and everybody else is currently losing money left and right because the economy is not functioning very well if everybody's in lockdown. And so all the states are uh, rushing towards a solution where they can limit the spread of um, the, the virus and at the same time have some form of uh, normalcy, new normalcy of being allowed to go out, etc. And in um epidemiology there is really there are only really two um ways of dealing with a with a growing pandemic before you have with scenes and treatments and that is um reducing the virology or the spread that is what uh, face masks and similar are for and the second thing is to discover people that are spreaders and for discovering people that are spreaders, you need um, two things. Number one, you have to be able to identify um, people that you can test for symptoms and test for the virus. And then in the second step, you want to get all their contacts and the contacts of their contacts to test them as well and to basically get ahead of the spreading curve. And this is a process that is usually done manually. Um, it's, it's a standard method. Uh, basically, you have interviews. You interview people and say, who do you, did you meet? Where did you go? Et cetera. And then um, the health authorities uh, call around, et cetera. Um, with the scale of the current issue, this is simply not possible anymore. Uh, we are unable to trace um, the contacts of hundreds of people manually. And it's also very error prone because people simply don't know or don't remember who they met, which is why there has been a um, big uh, push for automated contact tracing uh, technology. And it's something that the Chinese, 
uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, South Korea have have already um, deployed. And to to make sure what that really means, it's about creating a history of where you were and who you met at all times for the last 30 days, basically. And so that in case that you're uh, tested positive, um, they were able to, to figure out who your contacts were and um, etc. That is a, a huge privacy issue, um, certainly, because uh, both where we are at what time, and especially who we met, is dramatically uh, private. I mean, if you, if you um, uh, imagine that the state would create a tool that um, creates a, a contact graph or a, 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 um, the social graph of your life, because your contact graph is your social graph, then um, you are really talking about an Orbelian state. If a state has this ability to, to go back in time and say, who did you meet? Um, this, if, if that is uncontrolled and widely spread, that will be the go-to tool for any oppressive government, for every police, etc. Um, can, can I interrupt you for a, for, for a moment? Uh, of course. So, um, I, Yasha, who's sitting next to me, mentioned to me this morning that, uh, you know, Palantir is basically written to every, every government and has this software solution. Um, we, we see, you know, the willingness to, to push people to use these tracking apps. I've, I always call our, our cell phones, you know, your personal tracking device. And so, you know, the joke about, you know, this application will not tra track you or ban you based on your sexual proclivities or your religious beliefs or whatever is literally enabled by this. I mean, we're, we're bringing it in for, you know, this emergency pandemic, but the, the threat is on a, on a much higher level. Um, what sort of time frame do you see in, in actually the implementation of this stuff? How, 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 how close is it to us? The first states have already deployed it and have deployed it like two to three weeks ago. So it's, it's not something that is far out, it's something that is already here. And currently, the battle is between three parties, um, and it's a. I would actually consider it the the privacy war of this moment. Is on the one hand you have um, some very big corporations, and interestingly, uh, neither Apple nor Google are involved, at least not openly, um, and they are trying to push uh, their shit. And quite honestly whatever they're, they're pushing is actually not working very well. So a lot of the location-oriented systems do not work. And the, uh, a lot of the payment-oriented system, which is what, what Palantir, for example, is, is uh, trying to push, among other things, is something that simply does not work. And there are good arguments why it doesn't work, and there are tests of why it doesn't work. but Right now, there are a lot of vultures out there that want to get control and want to get money. And that is that is one issue. So the big corporations trying to open themselves new contracts and new data sources. Um, on the other hand, you have governments that are in um, between a rock and a hard place because a lot of their experts are simply not experts. They they don't know technical details on how this works, so they don't know the science behind epidemiology. And there are a lot of people talking bullshit to politicians, and politicians currently have um, a hard time figuring out uh, who's telling the least bullshit. And then you have a few people, especially in Europe, I think, at least from, from my experience, that realize that uh, contact tracing is going to come. It might be necessary or not, but it is going to come. So if it comes, we want it as private as possible. We don't want a third party having your location data. Um, we don't want anybody to, to be able to 
uh, reveal this data. Um, we don't want the police to have access to it. We don't. Want I have to seen. I have seen some some initiatives coming from some European politicians that have raised this issue. I forget who the who the German was that 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 put out a really good uh, series of analysis about what needs to be considered. Um, <clears throat> What, what sort of likelihood do you think that we have to, you know, to, to combat this? Is it going to roll over us without any resistance or? Right now, it's really hard to say who's going to win. It has a lot to do with resources. It has a lot to do with uh, political alliances. It's, it has a lot to do with who's going to have the first acceptable solution for a European liberal environment. And that solution will likely not be the best solution, but it's probably going to be the solution that's going to stick for a while. So the fight right now is really about demonstrating that good solutions can be built quickly and that can both help with fighting the pandemic and uh, preserving privacy. Coming from an open source area or, or you know, commons that you'd like to mention, people that are working on, on these solutions? Um, there are essentially three big uh, projects that are going on right now. There's something called Coepi um, that is one of the bigger open source projects. It, sadly makes a few assumptions that are not shared by epidemiologists so i um, i don't think it will it will become the solution then there is uh, a project that's called pppt um, which is a, a pretty big group of universities uh, companies uh, civil society that i recently joined um, and they are trying to, to build a system that is uh, both privacy preserving and effective. And then there are basically a dozen hackathon projects um, about contract tracing that are likely going to be crushed among those two plus whatever comes from big industry and surveillance uh, states, etc. Cool. Um, um, I'd like to I'd like to bring Frank in, into the discussion. So. Um, we're also dependent on on the internet. That's what's what's become incredibly uh, clear. And there's discussions now about, um, let's say, nationalizing telecoms or or providing internet service uh, as a as a commons project for 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 people. What likelihood, Frank, do you see that we're gonna, uh, you know, have have internet communications and connectivity as a as a public good well i think that the internet is probably gonna gonna stay i mean if the internet is shut down or uh, totally censored then uh there, there will be too many economic uh, functions that won't be able to work properly but what i think we will see a lot more of is uh, online censorship and also uh, moves to try to surveil um encrypted communication through things like um uh, mandatory backdoors or um, third-party access. Yeah, that's something really that I just wanted to lead into, actually. So, so the encryption fight, so all the legislation that's happening across the planet to 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 basically remove and fight about encryption. I mean, in the states, we're really literally on the edge while Corona is happening. There's a new bill that's going through. Um, it's a it looks pretty serious. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you can see that that uh, the fight about the the online narrative to Twitter um, is trying to censor people who have the wrong opinion. If you don't have the right uh, certificate of being a, an expert, then you're you might be censored and things like that. Yeah, that's that's a really something? important topic. Yeah. So expand on that, please, Arto, because I'm sure you could write a PhD about it. Yeah, so just in terms of Twitter, uh, Twitter has been uh, essential for understanding what was going on in China. The the party line, of course, was from China that uh, everything is under control, it's not so bad, the numbers are not so bad. Um, but at the same time, Twitter was revealing 
uh, I'm, I'm sure there are other social media uh, of relevance to Chinese users, but for the rest of us, Twitter was revealing what was happening in China. It was revealing the people people collapsing in the streets, you know, revealing the bodies being put outside of um, um, outside on the streets to wait wait for pickup. Um, it was it was revealing uh, the investigations into how many bodies were being burned a day in crematoriums. All of this was happening through Twitter. Uh, many of those accounts that reported on the situation in Wuhan have since been suspended for uh, dubious reasons, uh, at least in some cases I know about. And Twitter issued uh, safety guidelines, uh, so-called, two weeks ago. Uh, these safety guidelines, uh, uh, quote unquote, uh, the content that increases the chance that someone contracts or transmits the virus will be um, uh, deleted. This includes denial of expert guidance, encouragement to use fake or ineffective treatments, preventions or diagnostic techniques, misleading content purporting to be from experts or authorities. So um, if you think about the, the amount of um, uh, misinformation coming from authorities themselves, the World Health Organization and the CDC, uh, other governments, uh, that's rather worrying. I think what Frank, you wanted to say. one of the things that should, should really be mentioned here is that what we see is the complete reliance on very big American companies. So a lot of our communication freedom really depends on a single jurisdiction and not on, on being able to, to hop jurisdictions. There is no uh, European Twitter, there is no um, Austrian Google, etc., etc. So the the thing we really see is that all of us are American citizens when it comes to to uh, online uh, stuff. When it comes to regulation of speech, um, it is basically American law plus whatever they can put on top of it, and that is. That is one of the, the major situations we're in here, and that is also true for encryption. So just to, to, to make sure that everybody understands, we're not actually talking about a ban of encryption. What we're talking about is that all the big companies that are maybe offering our services and maybe offer encryption are going to be chickened in a, into a corner um, to not offer encryption. It has nothing to do if you can use it or not. Yeah, you're you're involved with operating a VPN. Um, have you, what's happening? What's happening in that in your circles? Uh, how are your clients responding? And how are state contacts uh, talking to you guys? What do you see happening? So, from an insider perspective, in providing such services, uh, privacy services never had a good um, position when it comes to liability. It's, I think it's one of the things that people don't understand when it comes to operating a privacy oriented service is that you are always one step into prison because you're liable, partially criminal, but mostly uh, for, for civil liabilities. And um, so that, is, that has always been the case. And some companies battle it by jurisdiction, uh, or, or jurisdictional arbitrage which is one of the things we're doing. We're, we're trying to, to balance uh, different legal systems and requirements against each other. Uh, other companies uh, simply fold uh, immediately, and then there are, of course, third parties uh, who nobody really knows who they are and, and do that. So our experience right now is nobody from our, our state communicators uh, gives a shit right now. Um, we haven't received any warnings, nothing in, in that regard at all. Um, we haven't had that for, for years. So um, either so they that, 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 silence, that silence scare you or does it encourage you? Pardon me? Does that silence from, from the state side uh, in the current state scare you or does it encourage you? It makes me wonder, but it doesn't scare me or encourage me. It's there, There's not enough signal to know what is really um, going on in their heads, but right now they, they have bigger fish to fry than us. And when they come around for people like us, 
we will be prepared and uh, see what's going to happen. That's that's it. There's there's no point in in uh, preemptive panic when it comes to those things. If you if you're in the business, you know the feeling of of the police being interested in you, and you know what a, a lawyer's letter looks like. So there's no point in. in yeah, in we're. I, I love the thing about we're all on so many lists that it's 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 literally the lists are unimportant to us. <laughs> so. Specifically, um, I'd really like to hear both you and Frank, maybe Frank can start this off, talk about the villages that you guys are, are, are planning. Um, you know, so the container village that you have in Berlin, and uh, I guess now you guys are extrapolating out into the immediate future. Um, what are the short-term and mid-term plans for expanding out the, the, the village idea that you guys have implemented in Berlin? Well, in the in the short term, we just yeah want to get a few more containers and just uh, get the basic infrastructure running. So that means we need uh, a running toilet. Uh, we need to be able to have people stay there, and uh, things like that. Um, and the the trade off is really you, as we can see in the situation, you kind of want a, like a, your own community, which is separate from the rest, but at the same time you. Um, have to be able to have visitors and attract people so that kind of means you have to stay in this like very densely populated urban environment where there are a lot of people who can who can come visit you with public transport and things like that but uh like we discussed earlier what you can really see right now is that these communities can communities can only properly work when you have have people living there which is not where we are right now but it's certainly something where we want to get to. Arto, um, remember Vinay's uh, uh, piece that he wrote about 10 years ago for the uh, Cyber Academy in Britain called the uh, um, Blind in the Panopticon piece, where he's talking about the, the price of omniscience. You want to talk a little bit about what the social costs are actually to, to implement um, you know, surveillance, uh, state-based uh, persecution uh, of people. I mean, we have the technical possibility now, but what likelihood do you see of of the of the social cost and actually acting on the omniscient data that the state has? Well, I think that's a that's a pretty long conversation, but perhaps we could uh, take a step back here and and outline the general threat model from the pandemic. Uh, so we did this uh, at some length in um, in the uh, pandemic uh, to police state podcast last Sunday. But uh, Smuggler mentioned we probably all agree that the biggest biggest uh, threat, if it materializes, is the mass scale contact tracing, because that will give uh, give uh, the state all states our social graph as well as uh, our our location, um, and uh, it will it will prevent uh, um, it will prevent things such as uh, using burner phones. Because who, who wants an unidentified anonymous SIM walking around, spreading the contagion? That'll, that'll be the, the justification. In, in general, anonymous SIMs and uh, burner phones are perhaps done for in most countries. I, I don't think in Ukraine, but uh, most countries. And um, the, the other topic uh, that ties into all of this is, of course, the, the um, elimination of cash. If you think about cash, cash is going to be a, a problem. Um, as in the state has for the longest time, or most uh, European states at least, have for the longest time wanted to kill cash in any case, uh, the usual justifications. And uh, now this is the best opportunity that has ever been handed or will ever be handed for killing off cash because cash is dirty in two, two ways. Cash is uh, dirty in the sense that it's used supposedly by money launderers and, and other uh, victimless criminals. And uh, the, it's dirty, of course, in the physical sense that you might have uh, um, you might have a, a virus on it. Uh, so, for example, in in, in China, um, the Communist Party destroyed billions of of yuan of cash and reissued it due to contamination concerns. And we'll see in the next months how justified those concerns are, uh, how much it will spread the contagion. But the the in any case, the justification is now there for for. Um, massively discouraging the use of cash. I think outright banning it is pretty difficult. Uh, some some states like Sweden 
would dearly love to do that, but they hardly need to because in the Scandinavian countries you have um, uh, mass, mass uh, use of plastic in any case. It's virtually 100%. On a recent visit to Finland, I was struck by uh, beggars in the, in the uh, middle of the city wondering um, how, how do they actually make a living because nobody has any cash anymore. I mean, that's, that's almost, almost uh, literally true. Nobody carries cash anymore. So the, the beggars might have to switch to QR codes or something for, for all I know. Interesting problem. Um, so, uh, Smuggler, you want to expand yeah, on that? Yeah, raise his hand. If, what did you want to throw in there, a Smuggy? Well, there, there are two things that are really important. So, number one, the attack on anonymous SIM cards is really a straw man attack because um, the question of if your SIM card is anonymous or not has nothing to do with the effectiveness of contact tracing. But still, everybody is saying, okay, we, we have to have more identification so we can make sure that nobody escapes the contact trace. So this is, this is a great example of, of um, people using straw man arguments to push through um, surveillance technology and regulation. The other thing I wanted to add is that, um, yes, we have an issue that uh, cash is, is under attack and that plastic cash um, in the sense of um, banknotes made out of plastic are so much easier to disinfect. But the other than the attack on cash and contact tracing, there's another uh, problematic aspect coming up, and that is uh, certification for immunity. So the discussion in this uh, field is that uh, several states are considering issuing in addition to your passport slash identity card slash I don't know biometric database or QR code that allows you to prove that you're immune to the current uh, virus. And this really um, is, is uh, necessary in, in, in some areas, or at least they think, in that the um, the the several um, jobs that you can have, like being a cashier or working at a hospital or at a kindergarten, um, it's really something that depends on your, you not being a spreader anymore. And that is, is something that is going to uh, easily create um, a, a situation in which we get a multi-class society of those that had it and those that didn't, which puts pressure on everybody to get infected so they can go back to their jobs. So it's a good example of, of, of states are really not good in dealing with incentives. So I noticed that we have four minutes left. Um, can I get a statement uh, of, of, of uh, a call to action from each of you and keep it to one minute, starting with uh, Arto? Um, well, right now, my own focus is on, on the life-saving technologies, as in um, I've uh, tasked my employees to, to uh, figure out which of the open source ventilators uh, can work. And um, they, they, there, will be, there will be many, many um, effects uh, that matter to us uh, from this privacy and um, liberty for, for the next years. I mean, this is, a, make no mistake, this is the biggest thing since World War II. And more people are dying every day uh, than died during 9-11. So this, uh, the, the, if you think about how the world changed in the last 20 years, if you think about uh, the, the, um, the shit we go through when we travel now, that's, that, what's coming is, is, uh, will make that look like child's play. But my own focus is on the, the life-saving technologies for the, for the moment. Call to action for our community and for the world. Well, it's very simple. I would say wear masks. The experts advice of uh, telling you that masks don't only work for doctors is clearly wrong. So masks reduce the probability of getting infected and it also reduces the probability of infecting other people. So even if you do not have the uh, N95 masks then make your own or use other masks, every mask helps a little bit. And if everybody wears masks, then uh, the contagion will reduce. Cool. Thanks. Smuggler. The thing we really have to get prepared for is for the after. Um, right now, everything we do is reaction. And 
a lot of the reactions are important, like uh, Arthur said, you know, life-saving technologies, and but Frank said, you know, don't get infected. But if we just react right now, we will be just receivers of what is um, planned by the big dudes. And it is really important for us that we individually and as a community find solutions on how to deal with the situation without giving our rights. And that really is a, it's an organizational issue. It's an issue of technology, for example, privacy preserving, contact tracing, but it's also a, a question of culture. So what we really have to be prepared for is long-term uh, usage of masks. And we need better mask technology that can be produced at home that is not just this kind of shit, but that allows social interaction, that is reusable, uh, that works for 12 hours outside of the house. And if you are not able to demonstrate as people that we can deal with the situation ourselves on an individual level, then this decision will be made by others. And that will be authoritarian. We have to step up and lead. Thank you guys so much for starting uh, this conference. It's been an honor to have you here. Thank you for having us. Thanks for inviting. Thanks for having us, man.